Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is session number 29, the penultimate session on Morgoth's Ring, as we are steaming away towards the end of our discussion, uh, which shall end next week. I'm calling it. I'm just calling it. It's happening. It's totally happening. Um, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing some skepticism, but you'll see. You'll see. We'll do it. Um, <laughs> anyway, thank you. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm sporting my shirt today. I was wearing my Balrogs Don't Have Wings shirt, uh, and then I was going to change before class, and I'm like, wait, why should I change before class? It's the perfect shirt for tonight. We're talking about the bad guys tonight, so there we go. <laughs> anyway, um, so let's, we're going to, we're going to mostly <laughs> jump straight into things. Uh, one, uh, first I will, um, I'll give you Arthur's attempt to derail me before we get moving on tonight's slides. Um, and that is, um, uh, uh, so Arthur had a really great question. I just, I got, I got, I got, I got to give props for this. Um, he said, uh, so we learned that the Elvish resurrection hinged on the Thea reconstructing the Hroa from memory last time. Uh, and he says he was thinking about this and he remembered the tale of Aragorn and Arwen at the end when he's saying goodbye and says, we are not bound to the circles of the world and beyond is more than memory. Reading this before Morgoth's ring, he says, I thought that was a, and it was a general statement, you know, that we escape the world and there's new stuff out there. But in the context of this new information, is Aragorn comparing the heavenly reward of men to the fate of earthbound elves who do not have more than memory, who have only memory? And increasingly, as they get closer and closer, you know, as a greater percentage of the history of Arda is in the rearview mirror, right, memory is more and more and more what they have until in the end, they are nothing but memory, right, in the end. Um... And be, but beyond the circles uh, of the world is more than memory. Um, Arthur, I think it's a fantastic connection. I was not thinking of that passage. The one, uh, I'm not sure if it's a qualification or not, but the one qualification uh, that I would give is I doubt it's quite safe to say that this stuff, you know, like this stuff about Fea and Hroa and memory and everything is what Tolkien was thinking of when he wrote Appendix A, because I'm pretty sure that stuff in Appendix A predates all this stuff. Rather, um, my suspicion is that it kind of goes the other way around. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to learn that that quotation from Aragorn's kind of in the back of his head as he's developing this stuff, right? That as he's writing the Athrabeth and Finrod is talking about the relationship between elves and memory, it would not surprise me in the least bit if in the back of his head, Tolkien was thinking of that quote and remembering that quote. That's exactly the kind of sort of retroactive significance that he gives to things like that when he's doing what he does really, really well. Um, so I think that that's, uh, um, I think that that's really, uh, but again, so with that one, like, um, uh, you know, sort of chronological sequencing, uh, uh, not objection, but clarification. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think that that's a really, really neat way to think about it. And I certainly share with you, uh, the sense that our discussion of Morgoth's ring has very profoundly, uh, uh, increased the significance of that statement by Aragorn. Um, so that's great. That's great. Um, okay. Uh, all right. I think I can move on. Oh, I guess the one push I should do or not push, but reminder, right? I don't have any imminent announcements. I've just done all the things <laughs> recently, so I don't have any imminent announcements. But um, uh, just a reminder, since I'm wearing my shirt, uh, about our Signum merchandise in the Signum store. I encourage you to go. If you go to the Signum homepage, signumuniversity.org, uh, and go under the support menu, you'll see the link to the store. Um, there's a blog post about the store too that you can click on and click through from there and you can see all of our uh, stuff there. I want to encourage folks to uh, take advantage of that because it's it's been a lot of fun. Um, but uh, okay, all right. Um, let's see. Oh, Jocelyn asks, 
uh, in yet another last ditch attempt to prevent me actually starting class on time. Well, not on time. That ship has sailed. But um, uh, do I think that reading this book uh, of the History of Middle Earth series so far has increased understanding of everything more than any other? You know what, Jocelyn? It might be. I mean, it might be. I, I, I don't know. I mean, there have been a number of really eye opening moments. Um, and uh, I mean, goodness, if I go back over the last how long has it been? At least five years. I, I, it was no later than early 2015, I think, when we started the Book of Lost Tales. Um, but anyway, it's been at least five, six years that we've been doing the history of Middle Earth. And certainly there have been um, there's been many an eye opener uh, during that time. But I don't I certainly don't think that there's been any volume of the history of Middle Earth that has that I think has been more profoundly revelatory uh, than Morgoth's ring in that way. It's 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 deep. Brian, 2013 was the beginning of the Mythgard Academy series. In the fall of 2013 was when we launched it. And we talked about the Lord of the Rings first and then Unfinished Tales. So it was after that. I mean, I'm just thinking of only the history of Middle Earth series. Um, but anyway, uh, so, uh, yeah. So, Jocelyn, I mean, as evidenced by the length Right. I mean, I've not really changed my strategy. It's just, you know, we went pretty long on Sauron Defeated because the Notion Club paper stuff is pretty dense. Um, some really some really dense stuff in there. Uh, but um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, there's nothing has kind of measured up to this. Uh, we've we've not done 28 sessions uh, on any other of the volumes uh, of the history of Middle Earth series. And again, it's not just because I uh, have changed my approach in some kind of way. It's uh, it's that's just been intrinsic to the nature of this book and the project that Tolkien has been undertaking uh, during this period, which Christopher is covering in this book, which means fair warning. War of the Jewels, when we get there, remember that he said that he was just kind of artificially separating out the um, the stuff up to the hiding of Valinor, right? And that the same stuff during, you know, more stuff from during the same period that we've been discussing is going to be contained in the War of the Jewels, where he's going to be going from the raising of the Pylori through to uh, the, um, uh, you know, through the end uh, of, of the First Age. So, it's going to be, I, I'm kind of expecting more of the same uh, in some ways. But anyway, quick, let's start. <laughs> okay, so we're back into Myths Transformed, of course. Now, tonight, the primary theme of what we're going to be talking about tonight uh, is the bad guys, right? We get a bunch of contemplations of Melkor. Now, I like this stuff a lot better than the let's think about what to do if we make the sun there from the beginning and try to... Um, uh, try to, uh, you know, re-explain the whole astronomical situation. But here, this uh, here is the tail end. Um, uh, is the 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 tail end of the uh, the discussion of uh, of the the sun and moon here. Um, and here, the period that he's talking about in the first sentence here uh, is that period uh, between. Uh, like the period of conflict between Melkor and uh, the the Valar uh, before the children are born. Um, this is the kind of the theme of this passage that I'm, we're giving you here is looking at given the you know that he would not give himself permission to write fantasy right and insisted on doing fantasy in the context of our real world astronomy. Um, he is, you know, sort of locking himself into this idea that he's got to redo the entire cosmology, um, and in that, but in that context, though, how does he preserve what can be preserved? How can he gather together the fragments of this, what feels like a shattered mythology, right? And kind of, you know, what can he preserve? Um, and one of the things that we saw already kind of creeping through in one of the earlier passages, one of the earlier passages, namely one of the passages we discussed near the end of class last time, um, was about the Eldar, right? I mean, how can they be the Eldar, the people of the stars, if the sun and moon were already up uh, when they were uh, when they were born? Um, so this is his attempt to explain how they could be the people of the stars, even though the sun had been there all the time. 
This period must be brief. Both sides know that the coming of the children of God is imminent. Melkor desires to dominate them at once with fear and darkness and enslave them. He darkens the world, added in margin, for seven years, cutting off all vision of the sky so far as he can, and though far south, it is said, this was not effective. From the far north, where they are, dense, to the middle, Endor, great clouds brood. Moon and stars are invisible. Day is only a dim twilight at full. Only light is in Valinor. Varda arises in her might and manway of the winds, and strive with a cloud of unseeing. But as fast as it is rent, Melkor closes the veil again, at least over Middle-earth. Then came the great wind of Manway, and the veil was rent. The stars shine out clear, even in the north, Valakirka, and after the long dark seem terribly bright. It is in the dark, just before, that the elves awake. The first thing they see is in the dark is the stars. But Melkor brings up glooms out of the east, and the stars fade away west. Hence, they think from the beginning of light and beauty in the west. Okay, so I will say that this is um, a valiant effort, <laughs> right? To you know, how can he make there be? So he notice how he's trying to 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 stick to the idea of a darkness over Middle Earth, right? A darkness that um, uh, you know the elves are still awakening in the dark, essentially, in the gloaming, right? They are they are still the people of the gloaming. They're not the people of the morning. They're not the people of the high noon. They're the people of the gloaming from the very beginning. Except now, it's an evil gloaming, <laughs> right? Now it is darkness. So now he's taken, essentially, something like the dawnless day of Sauron, uh, and projected it backwards. This is the big dawnless day, right? This is not, this is the dawn, these are the dawnless years uh, where Melkor is striving ultimately to fight against the sun, right? To establish a realm of darkness in order, with the explicit purpose of enslaving the elves with fear and with fear in the darkness, right? So he darkens the entire world and there's a war. There's a war in the heavens between uh, the clouds of Melkor, called delightfully the cloud of unseeing, which is a fascinating thing for him to call it, and the winds of Manwe, uh, right, uh, striving to rend the cloud of unseeing. I don't know what to make of the name. So let me explain why I find that name so interesting, and then I will explain how I don't know what, why, what it means, uh, or rather like the full significance of it. The Cloud of Unseeing, capital C, capital U. Um, so uh, there was a very famous medieval text, medieval mystic text, called the Cloud of Unknowing. Um, the Cloud of Unknowing is one of the most famous manuals of contemplation from the Middle Ages. That is, it's not just written by a Christian mystic giving his experiences, but it is written by a Christian, a Christian mystic in order to instruct novice mystics how to do it. Um, so it is a manual of instruction of how to, uh, how to, how to become a mystic, uh, how to contemplate. It would, that's the medieval word. Um, uh, to, uh, you know, through prayer and meditation and connect yourself more closely to God. The Cloud of Unknowing, again, is the name of this work. Um, so Cloud of Unseeing is a little bit different, but it's very reminiscent of the Cloud of Unknowing. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, especially with the capital C and the capital U like that. Um, so I, as I, I don't know the significance of that. I mean, the Cloud of Unknowing is a good thing actually, in the text. So, like, that, I I mean, I'm not going to, like, give you a digest of the whole cloud of unknowing in, in 60 seconds, but the concept of the cloud of unknowing uh, is that, like, what you have to do is you have to, like, push away all 
conscious thought, all of, like all sensory perceptions, all of the things that you can perceive and and feel around you, all the things that your conscience conscious mind wants to think of, and you have to thrust them all down as beneath a, cl- a cloud of un of, of, of unknowing. A cl- sorry, that's the cloud of forgetting. The cloud of, of forgetting, and then the cloud of unknowing uh, is is what is. Um, uh, what is above you that you're reaching towards. Um, so it's not about knowledge. It's about experience. It's not about, you're not opening your mind. You're, it's, as I say, I'm not going to try to give a whole pricey of medieval mysticism, but you you push these things down below the cloud of forgetting and reach towards the cloud of unknowing. Um, I get, they're not bad things. Like they're, they're both, they're, they're both good things. Really. They're part of the, they're part of the spiritual discipline, the mental and spiritual discipline of Christian mysticism, of medieval Christian mysticism, at least as taught within that text. Uh, so again, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I, I think that my, I, I, Joe, he can't not have thought of that. I mean, I, I, I don't think he could write cloud of unseeing and not think of the cloud of unknowing. Um, that seems to me impossible. Maybe it's possible, but I don't, I doubt it. Um, especially since he was quite, quite keen on this kind of thing, actually. Um, but, um, anyway, I, as I said, I don't to make of it, but, uh, I just find that very striking. It does remind me of Ungoliant as well, Arthur. I mean, that's certainly, you know, the unlight of Ungoliant is certainly one of the things that also definitely recalls. Um, but, um, yeah, <laughs> Matt says, well, he didn't think about bingo, but that's different, right? Uh, if bingo had been a popular song in 14th century England, there's a better chance he might have thought of it, <laughs> Matt. That's exactly the thing. Um, but um, yeah, good. Michael was thinking of Ungoliant, too. Yeah, no, I agree uh, with that. But OK, anyway. So so he's darkening the world. So in other words, the main thing here, right? The thing that's being, the, think about the ways in which this, uh, think about basically com- comparison and contrast, and con- think of comparing and contrasting this passage and what we get in the Silmarillion, right? One thing that we see that is much more dramatic in this version is the war, right? The battle in the skies. The battle, you know, this is essentially a battle for the hearts and mind of the elves before they're even born, right? Um, and that is, we don't see that. We don't see that. Just, I mean, we know that there is a kind of, you know, we've got, uh, you know, the Dark Rider and Melkor shows up and and uh, and they're afraid. You know, the, the induction of fear into the elves is, uh, is something that we certainly see in the published Silmarillion as well in the older material. Um, but, uh, but nothing on this kind of scale. Notice how this also places Melkor more firmly in his demiurgic seat, right? Um, Melkor is a much bigger deal. Uh, Melkor is somebody who is really able to control a significant portion of the world um, and vying very directly with Manwe on this kind of thing. So that's one thing. It really foregrounds the battleground, the way in which the elves are, are the battleground in which, like, again, in the published Silmarillion, which is, again, from the older texts, it just kind of sounds like the elves just kind of woke up and nobody really noticed for a while until Orome shows up, right? Melkor noticed first, but, um, but anyway, that's that's so that's one thing that I think is interesting that we can see him, um, in order to, I mean, if the end goal is to still call them the Eldar for some reason, um, there are different ways to achieve that, but the vehicle that he's used to achieve that is this, you know, war in the heavens, which again, I think is interesting. The second thing that I think is the second thing that I notice when I'm doing some comparing and contrasting here is that the claim essentially that the Eldar have on the name, the people of the stars is not their prolonged, the, 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 it's, it's not the length of their relationship with the stars. It's the saliency of their relationship with the stars, right? Um, they only have a brief relationship with the stars. They're born in darkness, covered by the darkness of Melkor. And then the veil is rent and the stars shine out clearly, right? In the north, even in the north. 
and after the long dark seemed terribly bright. So there's this sudden revelation of the stars, and then the darkness comes back again, right? So, I mean, you know, couldn't have been more than a couple hours because otherwise the sun would have come up. Uh, because, of course, the sun is still rising and setting like it does, you know, during this time. So it happened to be at night when uh, uh, when the, the veil is rent here um, and enabling them to see the stars. Um, but uh, but that was enough. Right. That one salient experience, that one night, which hopefully, you know, most of them were awake for um, when all of a sudden uh, the skies opened and they saw the stars and they were amazed. I do kind of love that last detail, though, that as Melkor brings up gloomy reinforcements, right, as like the second wave of of darkness comes in and swallows up the stars again, it swallows up the stars from east to west, right? The glooms that he bring up rise up out of the east as if in foreshadowing of the distant future. And this and the stars fade away in a westerly direction giving the elves a kind, you know, the vague and accurate, though uh, it's sort of accidentally accurate in a sense, uh, uh, you know, idea that there is light and beauty in the West and leads them to orient themselves in a generally westward direction. Um, so that's an interesting touch. Um, and what I like about that touch is that we can see once again that Melkor's own malice here works against him, right? We can. This gives us a fun illustration of how Iluvatar's purposes are served even through Melkor's own malicious actions, right? So, you know, Tolkien is making some excellent lemonade here. <laughs> you know, I mean, like it's... It's it's uh, he's 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 doing a good job with what he's giving himself, with what he's allowing himself. Um, I think that this is an interesting conception. But uh, uh, I, again, I still it's we are not in the same kind of world of mythology that the older mythology was in. I mean, which is deliberate. Right. I mean, that was the point was that the old mythology didn't work. It was too primitive. It was too silly. Right didn't fit the facts and so therefore had to be chucked. But, uh, you know, at least as he's thinking here at this time. Um, but um, but we can still see, you know, a lot of the same kind of uh, uh, mythological sensibility in the end um, and a lot of the theological depth that we have seen him applying through all this uh, is certainly still there. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. Um Yeah, good. Brian is emphasizing even how the way that like the ultimate effect of the darkness is to make the the, the stars shine brighter. Um, so as yet another example of evil turning to good unlooked for. Agreed, Brian. I think it's a really good point. Um, Arthur asks why the South was spared and do we see any consequences of this uh, elsewhere? No. I mean, we know that Melkor sneaked back into the North Pole because it was dark there. Right. Like, you know, in the he, he sneaked back to the North Pole in wintertime, uh, which was maximally covered by darkness. Um, but um, and of course, it makes sense because that's where he's going to build Utumno. Right. Utumno is going to be up uh, in the northern part of the world. So, you know, he sneaks into the northern part of the world. Um, and so therefore, there's always this northward orientation with Melkor. Um, I don't think the point is that. Things are different, fundamentally different in the South, but just that um, it shows, A, the limitation of Melkor's power. He's not able, in fact, he does not succeed uh, in spreading the darkness equally everywhere in the world. Um, and and B, it does also show that, um, you know, the, the sort of the north and westward bias of these uh, of these stories Th these are not you know th these are not all the stories that there are to be told just the ones in the northern and western part of the world the most important stories certainly in the in the you know these early days but um yeah matt is reminded of sam seeing the stars in mordor uh yeah i i agree i mean it's hard not to think of that passage when sam looks up and sees the star uh through the 
through the, the cloud rack there in Mordor, that the elves as a whole have functionally the same experience, right? You know, there's the whole newly awakened race of elves looking up at the, at the stars and saying, um, you know, there is light and beauty beyond the reach of the darkness, exactly like Sam did. Uh, that's that's kind of fun. That's kind of fun. Um, yeah. Brian says that the uh, spreading of darkness by Melkor and the war, you know, between the 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 gloom of Melkor and the winds of Manway um, has to him as as much of a feel of primitive mythology as the making in the sun and moon did back in the old versions. I hear you, Brian. I, I mean, I definitely hear that point. I, I think that that's, I mean, I don't know that they're exactly the same, but I, but yeah, I mean, I don't disagree. Right. I mean, I think that this is one of the reasons why, I mean, I think that Tolkien is really trying to ice skate uphill here. You know, I mean, like it's possible, but it's really hard. And, um, it's much more fun to go with the slope, you know? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, ultimately, I don't know, Brian, I guess the way that I would say it is he, he wrote what he wrote for a reason. Like there's a reason and it's not just his influence. It's not just that he's like channeling Finnish mythology and Norse mythology. It's not just that, right? I mean, this is the kind of, um, that, that kind of air of primitive mythology this is how Tolkien thinks. Allegory is not how he thinks, right? He is fundamentally not an allegorical thinker. Um, and when he does try to think or try to express himself anyway in allegory, he generally does it fairly clumsily. It doesn't work all that well, usually. Um, there's There are exceptions, Leaf by Niggle being a shining and luminous exception. But in general, it's not the way he thinks, and he doesn't tend to think or write very successfully in that mode. This, this is a mode. This is his mode, right? This kind of mythology, that is how he thinks, and that is what he's really good at. And so, Brian, yeah, like, even when he's trying to get away from it, is he really getting, he's changing the terms, right? But is he really getting away from it? I don't, I don't, I don't really think so. Um, now, Cecilia, you're right. Uh, Cecilia is pointing out, you know, speaking of me talking about allegory, um, the phrase that I use in Cecilia, I was using that phrase deliberately, war in heaven, right, does, could be projected in a kind of an allegorical way. Um, uh, there is war in heaven is a, a, a phrase, a quote from Revelation, um, the battle between the archangel Michael and uh, the dragon. But... Um, so, yes, I mean, it could kind of, you know, it, it there's a sense in which it could be sort of allegorized or, or thought of as an allegory. Again, I don't think he's really meaning it allegorically here, but it does have a kind of resonance with that uh, sort of level of the Christian tradition. And that idea, like the idea of that kind of not quite literal resonance with the Christian tradition is very like Tolkien in these later days. Right. I mean, again, think about the. His, his worry about the parody of Christianity, his kind of, I'm going to redo Genesis 3, you know, in the tale of Adonel, like that. We, we, we've seen that kind of thing a little bit more explicitly in these later days. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's keep going. And as is well known, the prime among these is Melkor. Measureless as were the regions of Ea, yet in the beginning where he could have been master of all that was done, for there were many of the Ainur of the Song willing to follow him and serve him, if he called, still he was not content, and he sought ever for Arda and Manwe his brother, begrudging him the kingship, small though it might seem to his desire and his potency. For he knew that to the... To, for he knew that to that kingship Iluvatar designed to give the highest royalty in Ea, and under the rule of that throne to bring forth the children of God. And in his thought, which deceived him, for the liar shall lie unto himself, he believed that over the children he might hold absolute sway and be unto them sole lord and master, as he could not be to spirits of his own kind, however subservient to himself. For they knew that the one is, and must assent to Melkor's rebellion of their own choice, 
whereas he purposed to withhold from the children this knowledge and be forever a shadow between them and the light. All right, let me divide this into two parts here. The first part being... Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because I'm suddenly reminding myself of Dante. All right, we're gonna we're gonna talk about Dante next. Uh, Dante in the Vita Nuova uh, gives his poem. You know, he 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 gives his poems and then he analyzes the poems. But his analysis almost always just dividing it into parts. He's like the first part of the poem is this part, and the second part is that part. So sorry, just the, my phrasing there was like it sounded exactly like Dante out of the Vita Nuova. Anyway, sorry, I'm dividing this into two parts. The first part uh, is the one in which. Uh, Melkor ha plays hide and seek with Manway, right? Um, and we've alluded to that before. Since Ea is the whole universe, not just the galaxy, but the universe, and Arda is the solar system, right? Not just our galaxy, but the solar system. Um, so we've got this one tiny little spot in the midst of the whole enormity of creation. And, um, Notice that this puts a kind of burden on Tolkien to explain that, right? Not to explain the differences in size and stuff, because that's not such a big deal. Nor even is the primary burden to explain the significance of Arda, despite its small size. This is something we've seen Tolkien explicitly address in his commentary, or the notes on the commentary to the Athrobeth, right? That its physical size... It doesn't really matter, right? Um, a a very small thing can be the place where the main story happens, even if it's only, like, you know, proportionally, you know, sort of like geographically or spatially very, very small. That's not that's not the point. Uh, that that doesn't really matter much. Um, so that Iluvatar would choose little Arda as the centerpiece for his for the drama of the central drama of creation, the drama of the children of God, of the Erohini. Um, that's not shocking. Nothing weird about that. That Manway would set up shop there in Arda, perfectly to be expected. What needs explanation is why does Melkor, who wants to be the boss of everything, not content himself with, like, the, you know... 99.9 repeating percent of Ea that he could have ruled unchallenged, right? Why doesn't why doesn't Melkor just sit back on some, you know, recline on some, you know, nebula somewhere and say, I am the ruler of all I survey, right? He could do that. He could say, I am master of Ea, but no, he's not content. Um, and his that that uncontentedness has to be explained. Again, Iluvatar is neglecting everything else, you know, or not, not neglecting, but again, appearing to like select out to choose Arda as the place for his story. That's not, that doesn't require a whole lot of explanation as far as Tolkien or the elves are concerned. That Melkor would leave everything else and pursue that one thing. That requires explanation, and so that's the explanation that we get here at the beginning. Him seeking ever for Arda and Manwe, his brother, begrudging him the kingship, small though it might seem, to his desire and his potency. I mean, he he, he could have ruled the rest of Arda, right? Uh, but he gave over the rest of Arda. He stopped concerning himself, or sorry, Ea, stopped concerning himself about the rest of Ea so that he could focus on Arda and oppose his brother and try to dominate the children, the Erohini. Um, yes, and Michael, you're right. We do see this inclination in Melkor, this inclination to nihilism up front. Uh, as you say, Michael says uh, he's he's preferring to undo the work of others rather than starting his own. Yeah, I mean, he had a lot of elbow room in AI, right? He could have set up his own shop, right? He really could have tried to do his own thing had he really retained the maker impulse, right? Had he really been wanting to build worlds for himself, there were worlds out there, you know, like it's it's um, that was um, that was that that was possible. Um but that's not that's not what he's where he's going. That's not what he's what he's into. Um, and then we've got 
the lie with which he lied to himself, right? Why is he focusing on the children? Why would he give up everything else? Not just out of spite against his brother, spite against Iluvatar. The desire. I mean, I I think that's right. I'm not disagreeing with you, Michael. I think that I I agree with you about the nihilism and the the desire to wreck stuff. Right. Um, that's like enough reason for him. But there's another one. He has, in his own opinion, an opportunity with the children of God. He cannot hold absolute sway. He cannot be the sole Lord and master of anybody, not of any of the other spirits. He's got a bunch of followers, right? There are a bunch of other creatures, of other Ainur, who are ready to follow him. I'm interested in that implication that there were more than, like, basically, uh, Melkor undersold himself, right? There were... There were many of the Ainur of the song willing to follow him and serve him if he called. But apparently he didn't call him. Right? I mean, that like, he could have had a, a larger following than he ended up with um, if he had bestirred himself a little bit in that direction. But he didn't. And why didn't he? Because, you know, his mastery over these other spirits, his mastery over uh, the... Um, his, his mastery over spirits that are of his own kind, it's disappointing, to be frank, right? He cannot be their sole lord and master because they know Eru and they know he's not Eru. They might side with him against Eru, right? Rooting for the underdog, but they're not going to worship him as if he were God. That's what he wants, right? Um, He purposed to withhold from the children this knowledge, that is, the knowledge that the One is. He wanted, his goal was to prevent the children of Iluvatar from ever knowing that Iluvatar existed and instead to worship him. He wanted to be a permanent shadow between them in the light. He's trying to interpose himself, metaphysically, between the children of Iluvatar and Iluvatar himself. Um, yeah. Yeah. As a shadow, Melkor did not then conceive himself. For in his beginning, he loved and desired light. And the form that he took was exceedingly bright. And he said in his heart, On such brightness as I am, the children shall hardly endure to look. Therefore, to know of aught else or beyond, or even to strain their small minds to conceive of it, would not be for their good. I am going to dazzle them, right? They're going to look at me and they're going to be completely convinced that I am the source of light in the entire universe. But the lesser brightness that stands before the greater becomes a darkness. That's one of those very quotable Tolkien quotes, isn't it? The lesser brightness that stands before the greater becomes a darkness. And Melkor was jealous, therefore, of all other brightnesses, and wished to take all light unto himself. Therefore, Iluvatar, at the entering in of the Valar into Ea, added a theme to the great song, which was not in it at the first singing, and he called one of the Ainur to him. Now this was the spirit which afterwards became Varda, and taking female form became the spouse of Manwe. To Varda Iluvatar said, I will give unto thee a parting gift, Thou shalt take into Ea a light that is holy, coming new from me, unsullied by the thought and lust of Melkor, and with thee it shall enter into Ea, and be in Ea, but not of Ea. Wherefore, Varda is the most holy and revered of all the Valar, and those that name the light of Varda name the love of Ea that Eru has, and they are afraid, less only to name the one. Nonetheless, this gift of Iluvatar to the Valar has its own peril, as have all his free gifts, which is in the end no more than to say that they play a part in the great tale, so that it may be complete, for without peril they would be without power, and the giving would be void. Oh, man. So, again, I have to... um, Although... 
saying I still don't like any of this stuff, right? I still don't like the premise. I don't agree with the basic premise of any of the stuff that he's doing here, essentially, uh, in, you know, especially with his astronomical stuff. Um, Tolkien's still pretty good at what he does, right? Uh, even when he's operating on premises that I think are mistaken. And um, the theological and mythical richness, the combination of theological and mythical richness that he has been attaining, and I think attains most beautifully and most fully in the Athrobeth, it's still there, right? It's still around. Um, this is a really fascinating concept. Um, the sanctification of Varda, the explanation of Varda's role, and incidentally, of course, the explanation for why everybody sings hymns to Varda and not to Manwe. Right. Everyone says Manwe is the elder king. Manwe is the vicegerent of, of Iluvatar in the world, all that stuff. Right. And yet, you know, you know Gildor and Glorian isn't wandering through the Shire singing hymns to Manwe. Right. Everybody, you know, Varda is most beloved of the elves um, because of the stars thing. Right. Sure. Yeah. OK. But shouldn't you throw Manwe a bone occasionally? Right. I mean, why? But here you go. Right. This is why, yes, Manway has the delegated authority over stuff from Iluvatar. But this is why. This is why Varda is the most revered. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Giant 98. I agree. This is sort of the revised Eldar mythology. Yeah. Yeah. And because uh, Giant 98, as you're sort of implying there, right? He was he he started off by giving himself a kind of out, right? The explanation for the limitations and silliness of the earlier mythology is that it's been, you know, it's it's been adulterated by humans over the year. This is not the pure mythology of the elves. So what does that look like? Not just the real story, but the mythology. Right? That's a different kind of story. And here we I agree. I think that that's what we're what we're getting there. Um, yeah, Stephen, I agree. Manway has not yet become the Celeborn of the Valar, uh, but he's, uh, he's, he's, he's on the short list. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, good. Good. Um, So Melkor, Melkor desires light and to take light. Iluvatar, Iluvatar counters him with this addition to this to the music, right? This new theme, not one of the original themes. This new theme, after the singing, which is to send special and unsullied light with Varda into the world. Now you remember the significance of this, right? Why? Why is Varda? being given this unsullied light. What is the destiny of this unsullied white light? Well, of course, as you'll recall, it's to make the trees. Um, it is an answer to the question, what is special about the trees? Um, how can you have the sun and moon there from the beginning and have the trees have anything like, even vaguely approaching, the mythic significance that they have in the original version? Um, how is that possible? Um, and this is his answer, right? It's about this special light. Um, it's about this unsullied by the thought and lust of Melkor light that Varda brings, delegated by, gifted to her by Iluvatar. Um, right, Brian, exactly. And ultimately to light the file of Galadriel. Yes, um, it is always appropriate to be thinking the Lord of the Rings first, right, with this stuff, because it's the Lord of the Rings. There is a very, in a very important way in which the Lord of the Rings, it's the dominant text now, right? Everything needs to be reconciled to the Lord of the Rings, not the other way around, right? Everything is to be re rewritten in order. Now, many of the ideas that he's had have gone beyond the conceptions that he had when he wrote The Lord of the Rings, and so there's some maneuvering that he has, but he's maneuvering around the text of The Lord of the Rings. He's just changing wholesale 
all of the text of the mythology, right? All the text of the legendarium. So um, he's, it's a totally different relationship. So I agree. It is always appropriate, I think, in this stuff to find the roots of these ideas. I don't know if roots is quite fair, but it's pretty close to fair, I think. The roots of these ideas in The Lord of the Rings. So yes, should we be thinking of the file of, like when we think of the trees, should we be thinking of Shelob's lair and the file of Galadriel? Yes, yes, we should. Uh, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, George says, is that because uh, The Lord of the Rings has been published in part? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in large part. I mean, that's in, in a sense, that's a fixed text now. You can still monkey with it like he monkeyed with The Hobbit, right? I mean, that's there's a precedent for that. It's still theoretically possible. But um, but more than that, and George, it's not just the fact that like one of them has to be, happens to be published and the other one happens to not. It's that he... The parallel I would make is the parallel with The Hobbit, right? You've got The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and of course, as everybody knows, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings have very different tone, very different storytelling approach, very different narr narrati narratorial style, right? Different narrative narrator voice. Um, they're very different kinds of stories, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Um, and he regretted that. In his later years, he wanted to bring The Hobbit, he wanted to reconcile The Hobbit with The Lord of the Rings, partly in terms of the events, but even more in terms of the tone of it. Um, and I think that that's the same kind of thing that's happening here. So it, it's, it's in that deeper sense, George, that he's um, thinking about the Silmarillion now needs to be reconciled. Okay, the, the, the Lord of the Rings isn't just the thing that's been published. This is the kind of story that he wants to write. He wants his whole, all of his story, like the larger story, Niggle's tree, right, of Tolkien's world. He want, like The Lord of the Rings has established the mode, essentially, that he wants to operate in. He wants it to be consistent with that mode, not with the tone, the, you know, the light uh, sort of jo joking tone of The Hobbit, um, and not with the funny old mythology of the Book of Lost Tales or even of its later uh, descendants. He wants it all to work. He wants it all to fit. He wants it to be uh, philosophically, theologically, narratively, textually consistent. Um, he wants it all to work within that framework. But the framework is the framework that's established by the Lord of the Rings. And again, I think not just by chance, not just, again, the, the, the mere chance that it happens to be the first one published. Of course, it's not. The Hobbit was published first, obviously. But but you see what I mean compared to the Silmarillion. Um, yeah. Exactly. Exactly, Brian. Um, he wants to tell... I, he basically wants to tell tell the... If not in exactly the same mode as the Lord of like the exact same narrative style or exact same narrative depth, again, at least within that kind of world. A world that is... He wants to be described doing a mythology that is consistent with the Lord of the Rings in ways that he feels now the older mythology just is not. Okay. Um... And yes, George, it does explain the Narn and the incomplete tour. We see him doing the first thing he does is to follow that same impulse with the great tales, right? To rewrite Turin and add much more and bring it and make it more like, I mean, the Children of Hurin, as it was finally published back in, when was that? 1990s? Was it? No, 2005-ish? Anyway, whenever that was, 2005, I think. Um... Uh, when the Children of Hurin was finally published as a standalone, like that's what Tolkien had in mind, right? That's what he was thinking of when he re was reworking the Turin story. It's clearly the same kind of thing that he was thinking of when he set out to write, though tragically not to finish, Tour uh, and the Gondolin story. It was 2008? Wow. I was wrong. Um, how time flies. <laughs> anyway, um, so... So yes, agreed. That so again, that that's where we can see that that whole kind of impulse there. Okay, um, let's keep going. The mythological association of Varda with the stars is of twofold origin. In the demiurgic period before the establishment of Arda, the realm, while the Valar in general, including an unnamed host of others who never came to Arda, were laboring in the general construction of Ea, 
the world or universe, Varda was in Eldarin, a Numenorean legend, said to have designed and set in their places most of the principal stars. But being, by destiny and desire, the future Queen of Arda, in which her ultimate function lay, especially as the lover and protectress of the Quendi, she was concerned not only with the great stars in themselves, but also in their relations to Arda, and their appearance therefrom, and their effect upon the children to come. Can I just say, that would be a really fun sentence to diagram. That whole thing was almost one sentence. There's one short sentence at the beginning. The entire rest of that passage I read was one single sentence. That is amazing. Anyway, um, okay, <laughs> so um, she is concerned. Remember, like, the stars are already there, right? So we can't exactly. So in what sense is she, kin is she the kindler, right? How can she be said to be kindling the stars when they're already all there, right? And the answer is... She's like the star advisor. She might not be, you know, she didn't like in preparation for the coming of the elves, go out one night and chuck stars into the sky, or like scoop up light from the vats and, you know, send it up in the sky and make them into stars. That's, that's, that's silly, right? The stars, everybody knows giant balls of flaming gas and there are lots of them and they've been there from the beginning, but she does still have a role, right? As the, so even at the beginning, before she sets up shop as the Queen of Arda, she is still concerned with the great stars in themselves, but also their relations to Arda. So she's organizing the stars, right? So we were to imagine her while Ea is being created, right? While, they're, while the Valar and other of the Ainur who don't come to Arda, but still labor in, in Ea, right? Um, that's, by the way, one interesting fruit of the distinction that he has drawn between Arda and Ea in these later years. In case you were wondering, well, okay, so we know that only some of the Ainur descend into Arda and, you know, become the Valar. Um, what were the others doing? What did they do with themselves, right, when they didn't descend into Arda? What did they do instead? Answer, well, goodness, remember, Arda is only one little bitsy bit of the, of the universe, Right, there's a whole bunch of other universe to work on, so there's plenty of uh, there's plenty of Ea to go around. Right, admittedly, they're not stage producing the major drama of the universe, but you know they 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 can still they've got other planets and suns to work on, so they're doing that. And but what's Varda's role? She's uh, the architect, right? No, no. No, no, move Rigel up. No, 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 that way. Good, right. Just there, just there. Um, so that from Arda, they would look in a particular way. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, and yes, Bruce and Stephen, I was deliberately quoting Eustace Scrub uh, when I talked about the, the giant balls of flaming gas. Um, yes. Uh, okay, cool. So, um, so that's the start of it, but now let's move on from that one awesome sentence. Such forms and major patterns, therefore, as we call, for instance, the plow or Orion, were said to be her designs. Thus the Valakirka, or sickle of the gods, which was one of the elder in names for the plow, was, it was said, intended later to be a sign of menace and threat of vengeance over the north, in which Melkor took up his abode. Varda was the most foresighted of all the Valar, possessing the clearest memory of the music and vision, in which she had played only a small part as actor or player, but had listened most attentively. I love the projection backwards of the listening feature of Varda, right? She is the listener. Um, and it's not just that she listens to the elves, right, and hears those who cry to her from Middle-earth, but also that she was listening very keenly to the music and is therefore the most foresighted of all of the Valar. So she knew that they would need to have an ominous and foreshadowing warning constellation in the north where Melkor would one day make his home, so she organized the Valakirka 
way in advance, before Melkor even comes, before the war even happens. But she's already she's already setting the Valakirka in the sky so that when Melkor gets there, she can point upwards and be like, look, dude, the sickle of the Valar is already hanging over your head. I totally knew you were coming, and I anticipated this. Um Yes. Yeah, so not only am I saying no to you, Melkor, right? Because remember, she's the keeper of light and he desires light, right? So she's not only is she going to be saying, I'm not into you, Melkor, but she's also going to be saying, look up, man. Yeah. Um, OK, later, when the Valar took refuge from Melkor and the imminent ruin of Arda and built and fortified Valinor in Amman, it was Varda who made the great dome above Valinor to keep out any spirits or spies of Melkor. It was made as a simulacrum of the true firmament, Tarmenel, and the patterns were therein repeated, but with apparent stars, or sparks, Tinwi, of greater relative size to the total visible area, so that the lesser firmament of Valinor was very brilliant. Nurmenel. So Tarmenel is the, the sky, right? The heavens, the dome of the heavens. Uh, Nur Menel is so so now we have the um, uh, the dome uh, the dome over Valinor Valinor is a domed land and this also is his mechanism for explaining how the trees can still exist and be important Right. Because, again, if the sun's rising and setting every day and the moon's rising and setting, why do we need this, the trees at all? Right. Well, they have the dome. Right. And the dome has the stars in it. So it's very brilliant. Right. Uh, and I like how the stars are larger proportionately. Right. So instead of just these tiny little pin pricks in, uh, you know, the, the velvet throat of night, uh, we have the, uh, you know, jewels on the velvet throat of night as Romeo would say of them. Um, so we have the, they're larger, right? They're big jewels. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Nancy says, kind of like Caesar's palace. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Valinor, Nancy, I think you're trying to say, was much more like Las Vegas. Yes, I think it's exactly what Tolkien was going for here. <laughs> exactly what he was going for. Um, yeah, so no, so Matt, the Earth is never flat in this version. We got round Earth from the very beginning. Round Earth, you can tell from the whole, like, uh, winter in the North Pole thing, right? Round Earth from the very beginning. Um, and we've got, but we've got, we've got domed Valinor. And I, I'm going to presume that Varda makes the constellations move. Right. Um, she she she, you know, she does the whole like diurnal cycle of the constellations on the dome. I probably I think. Um, yeah. So Matt Valinor is removed. No, this is from the beginning. This is from from after the the, the breaking of the lamps. Right. And when they re so same time that the that the Valar retreat to and set up Valinor and increase the distance, like open up the great sea in between Valinor. So it was, uh, you know, it was closer. And then they, they, they open it up, uh, to make a barrier, uh, for Morgoth, um, you know, to kind of be safe. Cause they, you know, are a little bit freaked out. Um, that's the moment at which we make the dome. So, it, you know, it certainly emphasizes the isolation of the Valar, right? The whole, we're, withdrawing from the rest of the world and keeping to ourselves, we're staying inside, right? You know, so basically the Valar <clears throat> are quarantining in Valinor together from the darkness. Okay. Now, um, this, now we're on to another essay here, and this is the one where he's talking about the power of Melkor. I gotta say, um, the ones, the parts, the essays that Christopher gives to us, or the writings, I guess I should say more neutrally, the writings that Christopher gives to us, the fragments um, in this section, the ones that I dislike most are the ones at the beginning, the, the astronomical ones. Um, these I like quite a bit. I'm very interested in what he has to say about Milkor. 
uh, and how he is conceiving of the nature of Melkor. Um, so, uh, yeah. Oh, right, Matt. Yes, you could sail to Valinor physically in those days. Yep, absolutely. That was before the taking away. Um, which I guess, I don't know how that happens, Matt, exactly. Like the, It's not the making of the world round that happens with Numenor. It's just the removal of Valinor, I think. Um, so you can't sail there physically anymore. But it's it's uh, um, but it was round from the beginning, you know, spherical coordinates from day one. Um, anyway, okay. So his thoughts about Melkor. Melkor must be made far more powerful in original nature. Cross reference Finrod and Andreth, the greatest power under Eru, the greatest created power. He was to make or devise, or begin. Manwe, a little less great, was to improve, carry out, complete. So Melkor's role from the beginning was to make, devise, and begin. He was going to be the primary delegated maker of the world. That was his job. That was his role. Manwe's role, lesser than he, but not by an enormous amount, was to improve, carry out, and complete. Later, he must not be able to be controlled or chained by all the Valar combined. Melkor has to be so much more powerful that all of the Valar cannot possibly compete with him, even all put together. Note that in the early age of Arda, he was alone able to drive the Valar out of Middle-earth into retreat. This is that story quaintly and clumsily described with the whole lamps business, right? Clearly, the breaking of the lamps and, you know, the ruining of the, of you know, of Almorin and everything, that's a, um, that's a primitive myth, right? That's clearly a corrupted mannish myth, right? The Eldar would not, would know that there were no big, huge pillars on which, like, the two bright lights lay, which then were literally tipped over and spilled out. I mean, honestly, please, Right? How uh, how primitive can you get? No, no. It didn't work like that. But what did happen, apparently, is that they all ran away. Right? That's that's a clear fact. Notice he is not described what happened instead of the lamps. Right? But that's kind of a high a, a gap that we don't see him filling in here in these uh, essays yet. But um, but he is in the early age of Arda. He alone was able to drive the Valar out of Middle Earth and into retreat. They can't compete with because he's got to be absolutely huge. The war against Utumna was only undertaken by the Valar with reluctance and without hope of real victory, but rather as a covering action or diversion to enable them to get the Quendi out of his sphere of influence. They're just trying to smuggle away the Quendi in the confusion. It's a it's a distracting action. The attack on Atumno is like Aragorn's attack on the Black Gate, right? Sort of. Not exact parallel, but kind of similar. Um, yes, Arthur, the men were the ones dumb enough to come up with the business of the towers made of ice that melted. Yeah, that's totally, obviously a corrupted human tradition. Clearly, clearly. Some joker. Anyway, okay, sorry. But Melkor had already progressed some way towards becoming the Morgoth, a tyrant or central tyranny and will, plus his agents. See the significance there? In the beginning was Melkor. I mean, in the beginning of Melkor's beginning. Not in the beginning of all beginning. Not in the B, capital B beginning. In Melkor's beginning, he was Melkor and this is what he was. That was his job. This is what he was meaning to, what he was meant to do. Then he became, from being Melkor, he became Morgoth plus his agents. Only all of those put, so he's dispersing himself. He's dispersing his power and very significantly weakening himself. Only the total, only the total, that is the Morgoth plus all of his agents, only the total contained the old power of the complete Melkor. So there's like a law of the conservation of Melkor, 
right? I mean, this Melkorism can't be created or destroyed, not even minor Melkorism, Matt. So um, uh, if there is any minor Melkorism going on, it's inspired by milk. It's, it, 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 it reduces from the total amount of Melkor, right? Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely the law of the conservation of Melkor. I mean, I think that's exactly what we're seeing here. Only the total contained the old power of the complete Melkor, so that if the Morgoth could be reached or temporarily separated from his agents, he was much more nearly controllable and on a power level with the Valar. So, what is left of Melkor when not combined with all of his agents? You get him on his own. And he's weaker. What um. What Lord of the Rings moment? Any anyone thinking of a Lord of the Rings moment here? Uh, <laughs> Stephen now wants wants a unit of measure uh, to measure units of Melkorism. Uh, that's I, I, I think uh, what should we call it? What should we call it? One unit of Melkorism would be um. Um. Hmm. Yeah, Arthur's already going ahead to a a, a, a Melko, Stephen. I can go with that, right? A Melko. Uh, so uh, Arthur's already trying to calculate the conversion rate between Melkos and Turins. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, but yeah, it's 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 pretty high. Definitely pretty high. There's there's a lot of Turins that go into one Melko. Uh, no question. No question. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, I, good. David is thinking, David Attlee is thinking about Saruman being caught alone and away from his fortress and his armies would have been vulnerable. He only just made it back to Orthanc. Good. I'm also thinking about the Witch King and the Nine, right? When they're assembled together under their mighty captain, um, uh, they are stronger. Right. I mean, there's they're not they You get the very clear sense that the nine ring wraiths are more than nine times stronger than one ring wraith. Right. Um, there is a there is a total. A, you know, the combination, the reassembly of them right into one place uh, is bringing together a, a power which is otherwise dispersed and therefore not just lesser, but but different, right? Weaker. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so... Right, okay, I'm good. Oh, oh, sorry, and Nancy, I did want to pick up on what you were saying before. It's the Melkor again. Notice how he is very distinctively changing that here. We got a random definite article earlier on, right? Remember, we were all like, what, the Morgoth? How long has it been the Morgoth? Earlier, Morgoth was just the name that Feanor gives to him, right? It's 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 his later name, uh, you know, the the black enemy. Uh, but um, you know, the black foe of the world. But um, now it's the more now it's a title, right? And he seems to be using it as a title, Nancy, in order because it's not just like he's had an identity change. It's not just now we like to think of him as Morgoth instead, right? This is not just, you know, Melkor is now like uncloaked as Morgoth, right? No, what's happening here is he is the more his position, his role as the Morgoth, meaning the tyrant of Utumno, right? The one who is attempting to dominate Middle Earth. Um, through his power and who has distributed his power among his armies and Balrogs and everybody else, um, that that is a thing that has a title. It's not just another name, because in a sense, he is not Melkor. It's not just that Melkor is sometimes called Morgoth. He isn't. Melkor doesn't exist anymore. Melkor has already destroyed himself. He is not Melkor anymore. He is now just the Morgoth. And so it, it, it depersonalizes it, right? It kind of, by making it a title, it depersonalizes it, but that's what's important, right? He has destroyed himself already, right? He is not, it's not just that he is less than he was. It's not just that he's a shadow of his former self, of his former glory, right? It's, it's not, it's not like he's an over the hill athlete or something like that, right? That's not the situation. He is, he has altered 
himself. He has destroyed himself in distributing himself. Um, now he's the Morgoth. And that's it. So, this enables the Valar to develop a cunning plan. The Valar find that they can deal with his agents, that is, armies, Balrogs, etc., piecemeal, so that they come at last to Atumno itself and find that the Morgoth has no longer for the moment sufficient force in any sense to shield himself from direct personal contact. Manway to perceive the decrease in Melkor as a person. Melkor to perceive this also from his own point of view. He has no less personal force than Manway and can no longer daunt him with his gaze. So all that's left <clears throat> when they get to Atumno and they're able to deal with his army separately and come at him alone, right? Well, now he's just like them. He's on their level. He is no longer Melkor anymore. He's just the Morgoth. And the Morgoth... Manway can take the Morgoth. Tolkas can take the Morgoth now, right? And he, uh, Melkor, can no longer daunt Manway with his gaze. Um, yeah, Stephen uh, is noting the phrase, for the moment. Um, uh, sorry, right, um... At last they come to Atumno itself and find that the Morgoth has no longer, for the moment, sufficient force in any sense. Yes, the moment, Stephen, in which he is separated from his armies. Right? If he were allowed to reassemble himself, not reassemble himself in the uh, Voltron sense, for those of you who know the 1980s cartoon or the more recent Netflix, Netflix revival, um, that is the different robots which assemble themselves into one big giant robot. I don't mean that he would literally physically take his armies into himself uh, and become some gigantic creature. What I mean is, I don't even know what I mean. But in some sense, if they were all gathered together, like the Nazgul all gathered together, like Saruman in his tower, like Sauron in Barad-dûr, um, or in the center of his power in the Samoth Naur, like he's stronger there, right? He would be stronger with all of, if, you know, so remember the mathematical equation, right? Melkor equals the Morgoth plus the sum of every bitty bit of himself that he's spread out into every orc and every Balrog uh, in his armies, right? So you bring his armies together, and put them between him and his enemies, and he is now stronger again. I think still not as strong as he was before, because they've defeated some of them, right? Um, but um, but anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, Bruce says, like Sauron, if he could get back his ring. Yes, more like Sauron, if he could get back his ring. Yes, like that. So that's the for the moment. Um, again, but Bruce, you see the parallel, right? Now, just as I was suggesting there was a kind of Black Gate parallel in the attack on Atumno, now it's like they're, they're coming at... It's like coming at Sauron without the ring, right? Sauron without the ring is lesser, is assailable conceivably, though not in the Third Age anymore, right? Nobody, um, you know, Gogolad, Elendil are not walking through that door. So, you know, like there's there no longer... You know, unfortunately, the good guys have dwindled too. What can you do? But, um, uh, but anyway, yes, it's it's it is like that, Bruce. That kind of weakening. Um, and yes, Matt, his power is dispersed in the matter of Arda. We'll get to that as well. It's another reason why, again, even with all the orcs, uh, another reason why with all the orcs, and if all of the orcs and Balrog could be together and with him, and he could be, you know, joined with them, and so you could be, you still would not be fighting. 100% Melko power, right? He would still be at a smaller, a significantly smaller. He'd still be stronger than all the Valar, but he would be still at lesser percentage because some of the some of those Melkos, uh, those units, uh, those Melko units of power have been distributed uh, into Arda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, good. Okay. Um, now, so what happens? What happens when he's confronted and he's on equal basis and he realizes that, in theory, he could get his butt very seriously kicked by the Valar here at the Siege of Atumno? 
Either Manway must tell him so, or he must suddenly realize, or both, that this has happened. He is dispersed. He didn't get it. He didn't see it. He didn't even really figure it out until now. And it's only now when he's saying, oh, shoot, I'm vulnerable. Or Manway will tell him, by the way, did you notice how vulnerable you are right now, Melkor? Like, you are, you are, um... You are a you are a, a a shell of your former self, brother mine. But the lust to have creatures under him dominated has become habitual and necessary to Melkor. So that even if the process was reversible, possibly was by absolute and unfeigned self-abasement and repentance only, he cannot bring himself to do it. So could he heal? Could he undisperse himself? Could he? suck all of the units of Melko back into himself and become Melkor once again? In theory, yes. But only by self-abasement and repentance. So, no. He won't do it. He won't do it. Um, he can't bring himself to do it. So now he's stuck. As with all other characters, there must be a trembling moment when it is in the balance he nearly repents and does not and becomes much wickeder and more foolish. This is Melkor's turning point. Redefined. His turning point has been redefined as this moment. He has the op. He could, in theory, repent for reals right here when confronted by Manway and the other Valar. And if he did, he could have reassembled himself. He could have undispersed himself. And he almost did. He almost repented, Tolkien says. But he doesn't. And this is the moment when he is on his permanent downward spiral. Right? His lack, his failure to repent. This is Melkor's stairs of Kirith Ungol. Right? Uh, the, what, the moment that Gollum had, the trembling moment, when Gollum almost repents returning from Shelob's lair and finding the two hobbits sleeping and reaching out to Frodo affectionately, that's the trembling moment for Gollum. And after that, he becomes much wickeder and more foolish. Um, yeah, yeah. Possibly. And he thinks it possible. He could now, at that moment, be humiliated against his own will and chained if and before his dispersed forces re reassemble. So, Stephen Wright, there's still a chance, right? Uh, if uh, he can stall until his armies come back together and then he can be reunited with them and then, you know, he could uh, take out the rest of the Valar. So, as soon as he has mentally rejected repentance, he, just like Sauron afterwards on this model, makes a mockery of self-abasement and repentance. He makes a mockery of self-abasement and repentance. So his repentance is a mockery from the beginning. He is totally playing Manway from the start. From which, actually, he gets a kind of perverted pleasure, as in desecrating something holy. For the mere contemplating of the possibility of genuine repentance, if that did not come specially then as a direct grace from Eru, was at least one last flicker of his true primeval nature. In that moment, he had, he contemplated the possibility of genuine repentance. And that was the moment when the last flicker of his true primeval nature died, when he rejected that. And in rejecting that, having just perceived that possibility and rejected it, he then immediately desecrates it. And he takes a perverted pleasure in exploiting their desire to see him repent, right? Um, in making a mockery of self-abasement and repentance. He feigns remorse and repentance. He actually kneels before Manway and surrenders. In the first instance, to avoid being cha uh, chained by the chain and Gynor, which once upon him, he fears he would never be able to shake off. So he, notice the chaining of Melkor. Melkor is never chained. Melkor is never chained in the new version. Um, he's afraid of the chain. He thinks it might have power to hold him. 
but he doesn't. Instead, what replaces the wrestling match with Tolkas in which he's thrown on his face and then he, the chain and Gynor is heaped upon him, what replaces that um, uh, what replaces that is um, a spiritual drama. A spiritual and psychological drama replaces the somewhat comical wrestling match of the old mythology. This is the mythology grown up, right? This is what that's the kind of thing that we're going to see in the grown up mythology. Um, and that I find really interesting. Oh, man, I can't believe I missed that. Arthur, you'd love this. So I have to tell you. Um, Autoflagellator in the Twitch chat was just saying that Melkor reassembling, uh, undispersing himself from the world would probably violate a law of Melko dynamics. Yes, yes, it would. I think it's probably the first law of Melko dynamics. Um, yeah, anyway, okay. Um, good. Yes, and Matt, it's supposed to remind you of Sauron after Morgoth's fall at the end of the First Age. He, too, um, uh, makes a mockery of self-abasement and repentance. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, yep, yep. <laughs> okay, all right. Let's keep going. But also suddenly... He has the idea of penetrating the vaunted fastness of Valinor and ruining it. What are we thinking of now? Again, notice how so much of this later mythology that he's developing is designed to be echoes of the, or rather, designed to be the big original of which the later stories that he's already written are echoes. Right. He is the way that he sort of takes Sauron's story and writes it backwards in larger letters in Melkor's career. You see exactly just like Sauron and Numenor. Exactly. Exactly. Um, He's going to do a Sauron. Right. Oh, yeah. No, take me to Valinor. That's totally what you should do. I am so sorry and I will be even more effective in my repentance and amendment if you take me back with you to Valinor that I can wreck. Yes. So he offers to become the least of the Valar and servant of them each and all to help in advice and skill in repairing all the evils and hurts he has done. It is this offer which seduces or deludes Manwe. Manwe must be shown to have his own inherent fault, though not sin, he has become engrossed, partly out of sheer fear of Melkor, partly out of desire to control him, in amendment, healing, reordering, even keeping the status quo to the loss of all creative power and even to weakness in dealing with difficult and perilous situations. Against the advice of some of the Valar, such as Tolkas, he grants Melkor's prayer. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, Michael, I agree. Michael says, we may prefer the Silmarillion as we know it, but if this was all we had, it might have been an adequate backstory. Um, this is very skilled retconning or foreconning or whatever it is, right? Yeah, no, I agree. This is not, this is not bad. This is not bad. Um, um, Manway's fault. Manway's fault is that he has become engrossed in amendment, healing, and reordering, even in keeping the status quo, like the elves, with their preservationist desire. Amending, healing, reordering, keeping the status quo. It's almost like Manway has an elvish ring of power, right? Or rather, that the elvish rings of power are trying to recreate some little vague echo of the power of Manway himself, right? Um, I also love, I don't know that we'll get to it tonight, but I also love when later on he talks about Manway's job. Like, Manway's got a tough job, right? Manway has, a, has an undesirable job. 
his job as you know the you know regent of Iluvatar here in the world is um, look. It's not got a lot of job satisfaction. It's a tricky, tricky proposition, and I love it when he compares it to Gandalf's job. Right, that's the parallel. What Gandalf is to Sauron, Manwe is to Melkor. Um, and he even has, um, and he even has a similar retirement impulse, right? When Gandalf's job is done, when Sauron is defeated, Gandalf's like, I'm out, right? I'm done. I've checked that off my bucket list. I'm going back to Valinor. I'm, I've completed my, my job. When M Melkor is defeated, Manway's done. He's, he's, he's ready for retirement at that point. Um, yeah, <laughs> Stephen says, see, Manway is slowly becoming Caliborn. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Um, yeah, David also is noticing an interesting parallel between uh, Manway and Frodo. Um, Frodo's mercy turning out well, but Manway's going wrong. And that seems a bit surprising. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, okay, let's keep going. Melkor is taken back to Valinor, going last, save for Tolkis, who's, who follows Bering and Gynor, and clinking it to remind Melkor. Can I just say as a side note, I'm really glad that no matter what else happened to change in this mythology, Tolkis is still awesome. <laughs> right? Like, you can't dampen Tolkis' personality, even when you're totally recasting the mythology. Like, that image of Tolkis... Uh, following along behind Melkor, suggestively clinking the chain. Uh, like, actually, I kind of love that. Like, I, 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 it's almost worth the price, actually. Uh, <laughs> it's almost worth the price. Uh, but anyway, but at the council, Melkor is not given immediate freedom. The Valar in assembly will not tolerate this. Now, notice the council, by the way, this is not after ages of imprisonment. Right? He's not taken, chained, and chucked into Mandos right away. He t he's brought back to Valinor, and they immediately have a council in Valinor. And he's not given his freedom. The Valar and Assembly will not tolerate this. Manway wanted to. That's what Manway wanted. He's going to bring him back and, and let him, because he's repented, right? The Valar and Assembly will not tolerate this. Melkor is remitted to Mandos to stay there in reclusion and, rem and, me and meditate, and complete his repentance and also his plans for redress. Then he begins to doubt the wisdom of his own policy. Well, shoot, I didn't expect to be chucked in prison and he can't escape from Mandos, right? So his brilliant, I'm going to go and wreck Valinor from within plan seems to be backfiring on him because, of course, now he is permanently separated from the rest of his minions, right? He is now operating at a low wattage Melko power, right, in prison, and there's nothing he can do about it. This looks very bad. This could be permanent. Um, then he begins to doubt the wisdom of his own policy and would have rejected it all and burst out into flaming rebellion, but he is now absolutely isolated from his agents and, and in enemy territory. He cannot... Therefore, he swallows the bitter pill, but it greatly increases his hate, and he ever afterward accuses, accused Manway of being faithless. Just like Gollum in The Hobbits. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, he convinces himself that he's been done wrong, that he agreed to come to Valinor with Manway because Manway promised that he would be released, right? Um, because he believed that he repented. And then he's chucked into prison. He was betrayed! He was betrayed! Manway deserves it! Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. The rest of the story, with Melkor's release and permission to attend the council sitting at the feet of Manway, after the pattern of evil counselors in later tales, which it could be said derived from this primeval model, can then proceed more or less as already told. 
So from here on, it's 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 the same, right? He's gonna be, now he's gonna be there for ages, and he's gonna come out, and he's gonna be released, but he's gonna be really ticked off underneath, right? But he's still gonna be playing it cool, and then he, you know, Ungoliant, and then the trees, and Finway, and the Silmarils, and Otumno, and Iron Crown, and off we go. Off we go. Okay. Fascinating. Now, let's do some comparison and contrast with Sauron. Uh, cause we're, as I recall, we're jumping, right? Yeah. This is the next, this is the next, uh, that's, that's the end of our discussion of that essay, the big Melkor essay, the first big Melkor essay. Now comes the Sauron essay and the comparison with Sauron and Melkor. Sauron, however, inherited the corruption of Arda and only spent his much more limited power on the rings for it was the creatures of earth, not in their minds and wills that he desired to dominate. Remember, Melkor is like many orders of magnitude more powerful, right? He has like so many more Melkos. He has like Hecta Melkos uh, compared to like the, the what probably like Desi Melkos that um, Sauron has. Not even Desi Melkos. He probably has only got like maybe Centa, maybe Centa Melkos. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I easily Hector Melkos um, uh, that that uh, Melkor originally had. But he spent all of those. He used up all of those Hector Melkos in the corruption of Arda. Right. He dispersed himself into the material world itself. And, you know, in the in the process of marring. Of marring Arda. Right. Um, and. uh but Sauron didn't, right? S S Sauron had that all pre-made for him. So he doesn't distribute himself into the into physical matter, right? Yeah, he distributes a lot of his power into the ring. But all he cares about is dominating their minds and wills. He doesn't care about their bodies. In this way, Sauron was also wiser than Melkor Morgoth. Sauron was not a beginner of discord. And he probably knew more of the music than did Melkor. I love that. He probably knew more of the music than did Melkor, whose mind had always been filled with his own plans and devices, and gave little attention to other things. The time of Melkor's greatest power, therefore, was in the physical beginnings of the world, a vast, demiurgic lust for power and the achievement of his own will and designs on a great scale. And later, after things had become more stable, Melkor was more interested in and capable of dealing with a volcanic eruption, for example, than with, say, a tree. It is indeed probable that he was simply unaware of the minor or more delicate productions of Yavanna, such as small flowers. So Melkor had never even noticed flowers, right? Not only did he not stop to smell them, he had never deigned to notice that they existed, right? Um, that's the world of Melkor. That's not the world of Sauron, right? Sauron pays much more attention. Sauron is in this way wiser because he is less self-absorbed from the very beginning. That's the biggest distinction between Sauron and Morgoth is that Morgoth was from the beginning, like from the start of the music. He was all about trying to, you know, about his own voice and trying to have a solo, Right. From, and so he didn't even pay attention to the music. He doesn't even get the world. Sauron doesn't. He doesn't get history because he didn't pay attention. Sauron did pay attention. And so he knows more about it and is therefore able to manipulate it differently and in some ways better than Melkor. Um, okay. Morgoth had no plan unless destruction and reduction to nil of a world in which he had only a share can be called a plan. But this, but this is, of course, a simplification of the situation. Sauron had not served Morgoth, even in his last stages, without becoming infected by his lust for destruction and his hatred of God, which must end in nihilism. Sauron could not, of course, be a sincere atheist. Though one of the minor spirits created before the world, he knew Eru. That is, I should emphasize, though one of the minor spirits be uh, created before the world, he knew Eru, according to his measure. 
So he, Sauron is under no illusions about the existence of Eru. He cannot be a sincere atheist. He probably deluded himself with the notion that the Valar, including Melkor, having failed, Eru had simply abandoned Ea, or at any rate Arda, and would not concern himself with it anymore. So he knows Eru exists, but he's really hoping Eru isn't paying attention. Right? He has reason, believes he has reason to think that um, that Iluvatar is totally hands off when it comes to the world anymore, in which case he, Sauron, could probably get away with a lot of stuff, right? He doesn't have the great cosmic ambitions that Melkor has. He just wants to set up a nice little fiefdom for himself here in Arda, right? And if Eru's not paying attention anymore, he could totally manage that, right? All he's got to do is to find a way to get around the Valar. No problem. It would appear that he interpreted the change of the world as the downfall of Numenor, when Amon was removed from the physical world in this sense. The Valar and Elves were removed from effective control and men under God's curse and wrath. Gorgeous. So the downfall of Numenor was a setback for Sauron. I mean, it was an uncomfortable day. Let's not, there are no two ways around that, right? I mean, that day did not pan out the way that Sauron had in mind at all. And also keep in mind, I would add to what Tolkien says here, going backwards to the story just a couple weeks from there, right? You can see his plan about pointing Arpharazon in the direction of the Valar. He had Arpharazon pointed at him, right? He looked down the barrel of the Numenorean gun and raised his hands, right? He knew what the Numenoreans could do. And so what does he do? He works to turn that gun against Valinor. Right against the Valar, because hey, this this is great. This his humiliation is his great opportunity. Right, this thing, the Numenorean thing, right, Numenor. This is the greatest weapon that has ever been in the world. And if anybody has a chance of making things pretty uncomfortable, I mean, does is he trying to bring about the downfall of Numenor? Is he just hoping the Valar are going to squish them like bugs? Yeah, but it's a win-win situation for him, right? But again, I don't think that he thinks that Arpharazon actually has no choice. Remember, in the earlier legends that we read way back in the... I'm looking over at my bookshelf here around the corner. Back in the shaping of Middle-earth days, and especially the Lost Road days. No, it's mostly the Lost Road days. Back in the Lost Road days, the Numenorians, the, the, Val, the, the Valar were in fact afraid. Um, the, remember that in those days, the Numenorians had advanced to modern technology. They were preparing to carpet bomb Valinor. When Manway says, "You know what, Iluvatar, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to you on this one. Uh, you want to step in here because this is getting seriously awkward." There was really, um, there was really a chance that the Numenorians could win, or at least do some really bad stuff, right? So again, win-win situation. So plan A, that's plan A for Sauron. How is he going to get himself free? Because Eru's not paying attention anymore. That seems a given. So it's only the Valar he's got to worry about. Let's point the Numenorians at him. And then, and then what happens? Again, uncomfortable day. Sauron was not happy on that day. Things didn't seem to be going well. Except the outcome is exactly what he would have always wanted the Valar removed from the picture, right? The, I mean, if Eru did that, then the last act of Eru in his connection to Arda was to permanently abandon the world, right? To withdraw the Valar from it and to abandon the world to men whom he damned, right? Whom he, who are under his curse and wrath, Right? In other words, Sauron is like, and now it's all mine, right? So at the end of the Second Age, when Sauron returns to Middle-earth, he doesn't return to Middle-earth, again, through this new story, he doesn't return to Middle-earth in defeat and disgrace. He doesn't limp back home from Numenor, right, doing the... Well, it's not, not a walk of shame. Presumably he didn't walk. But, you know, like, the... I don't know how he was moving. 
<laughs> did he take a body first? Did he hover uh, in, in, in spirit form? I don't really know. But anyway, you know, he, so he doesn't just come back in disgrace to Mordor, right? Um, and say to the Nazgul, don't tell anybody about that, right? Um, I, let's agree to never talk about this ever, right? No, he comes back laughing. He comes back laughing. Hey, I won. It worked. It worked like better than I expected. I mean, if they had have destroyed each other, that would have been great. But, you know, it would have been less thorough going than this. Now they're gone. They're all gone and they can't come back. There's going to be no war of wrath. Right. There's not going to be no ships of the Teleri that are, that are going to bring, you know, Aeon way back to Middle Earth to take me out. Right. That isn't going to happen. So, boom, we've won. Well, then Elendil and Gilgalad have something awkward to say about that, right? But that's really interesting. And, of course, exactly. It's not the ships of the Teleri bearing the armies of the War of Wrath in. It's just the boat with the Teleri on it, with the Astari on it, rather. Yes, exactly. Um, okay. All right, more. Let's see. Um, where did I, I stop in the middle of the paragraph? Okay, right. Would not concern himself with it anymore. It would appear that he interpreted the change of the world and right. I already said that. Uh, removed from effective control and men under God's curse and wrath. That's where I ended. Okay, if he thought about the Astari, especially Saruman and Gandalf, he imagined them as emissaries from the Valar seeking to establish their lost power again and colonize Middle Earth, as a mere effort of defeated imperialists without knowledge or sanction of Eru. So, like, it's a feeble attempt by the Valar to try to reestablish some kind of hold in Middle-earth, right? Which they're doing off their own bat. Like, no reason to think that Eru's behind that at all. His cynicism, which sincerely regarded the motives of Manwe as precisely the same of his, <clears throat> as his own, seemed fully justified in Saruman, right? See, look at that, right? He sends these wizards and one of them tries to set up for himself. That's just what I expected, right? Theory confirmed, says Sauron. Gandalf, he did not understand. But certainly, he had already become evil, and therefore stupid, enough to imagine that his different behavior, Gandalf's different, different behavior, was due simply to weaker intelligence and lack of firm, masterful purpose. He was only a rather cleverer Radagast. Cleverer because it, it is more profitable more productive of power to become absorbed in the study of people than animals. Yeah, he's a slightly upgraded Radagast. Radagast is totally wasting his time with birds and beasts. I mean, who cares? They can be, birds and beasts can be a little bit useful sometimes, but like, get over it, Radagast. It's useless, ultimately. Right now, going about and, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, involving yourself in the business of people, now that's more profitable, Right. That shows some a little bit of brains, at least more brains than Radagast has, right? But it still falls way short of the Saruman mark, right? The wisdom which Saruman is boasting about in his speech to Gandalf is clearly Sauron's wisdom here as well. Absolutely. Manway's task and problem was much more difficult than Gandalf's. Hey, we did get here tonight. Sauron's relatively smaller power was concentrated. Morgoth's vast power was disseminated. The whole of Middle-earth was Morgoth's ring, though temporarily his attention was mainly upon the Northwest. Unless swiftly successful, war against him might well end in reducing all Middle-earth to chaos, possibly even all of Arda. I mean, if you think about it this way, if... if... Melkor has distributed himself in all of the, like, it's not, you don't have to just defeat Morgoth. You've got to then also find a way to, like, extract all of the Melkos out of everywhere, right? How do you do that? I mean, how do you, you know, it's like trying to take all the salt out of the ocean, right? Or, or you know, I mean, it's just, how can he do that? Morgoth, sorry, not the Morgoth, Melkor, is now, like, in solution, right? To use a chemical rather than a physical metaphor here, right? Um, it's like he's trying 
man way, that is, right? He's got to go against the first law of Melko dynamics, right? The distribution, not the not the 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 bringing. It's almost like he's got to bring it back together in order to extract it, right? He has to purify each bit of Olivarda, right? Purge it of the taint of Morgoth. And we can, of course, begin to see why Manway kind of maybe becomes a little bit obsessed with the cleansing and healing of things and the preservation of things, right? If there's some bits that don't have the Milkos distributed in them, can, can we can we hang on to those, right? Can we keep those the way that they are? And can we find some way to extract the Milkos from everywhere else? It's a heck of a job. Wouldn't want it myself. It is easy to say it was the task and function of the Elder King to govern Arda and make it possible for the children of Eru to live in it unmolested. Yeah, that's easy to say. But the dilemma of the Valar was this. Arda could only be liberated by a physical battle. But a probable result of such a battle was the irretrievable ruin of Arda. Moreover, the final eradication of Sauron as a power directing evil was achievable by the destruction of the Ring. No such eradication of Morgoth was possible, since this required the complete disintegration of the matter of Arda. You could do it, right? You could weaken Morgoth in the same way that Sauron was weakened by the destruction of the Ring, for the low, low price of disintegrating all of Arda, right? Then Morgoth would be so permanently, he would just be the Morgoth. That's all that's left, right? All those other Melkos would then be distributed, you know, would then be dissipated, basically, and um, and you solved your problem by means of destroying everything that you were trying to protect. Yeah, Gandalf had it easy, man. Chuck the ring in the fire, please. That's trivial compared to Manway's problem. Sauron's power was not, for example, in gold as such but in a particular form or shape made of a particular portion of total gold. Morgoth's power was disseminated throughout gold, if nowhere absolute, for he did not create gold. It was nowhere absent. So it was, so all gold in the world has Melkos in it, right? Um, now, it's not totally dominated by Melko, uh, but it's nowhere absent either. It was this Morgoth element in matter, indeed, which was a prerequisite for such magic and other evils Sauron practiced with it and upon it. Whoa. So Sauron does magic. The, the magic of the enemy, right? That Those things that Sauron can do, which hobbits uh, un, incautiously use the word magic to describe... Sauron is channeling the Melkos and using those Melkos because he only has like some Centimelkos or some Millimelkos of his own. Let's call them Centimelkos, but he can utilize like the micro Melkos that he finds in the rest of the world around him and use those and, and avail himself of those micro Melkos in order to perform the evils that he practiced. That's kind of wild, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, yeah, David says, so when Sauron tortures and destroys the very hills, it's because the matter of the world is already aligned toward him. Yes, though I would add, David... The like the, uh, you know, the slag heaps, which look like the mountains have vomited the filth of their entrails and, you know, all that stuff, um, the stuff that makes Sam sick. This is also a reflection. He is infected with some degree of the of the the, the nihilism of more of Melkor. Right. I mean, Tolkien did say that. So he's not like totally abandoned to nihilism in the same way that Melkor was, but he, he does still have it. So there is some of what we see with Sauron, which is just, just the, the impulse to destroy, just the desire to wreck stuff. He definitely still has that, um, but it's not his only goal anymore. And it is true that the very hills, um, the reason he's torturing 
the very hills, David, exactly as you suggest, might not be for purely nihilistic reasons, right? Um, he's torturing the hills because he's trying to get something out of them, right? He's 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 torturing the hills in order to harness Melkos, right? The power of Melko, uh, Melkor that was in there. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, Jennifer, you're right. Somebody does need to invent a Melko counter to determine which s substances are Melko active and uh, how much. Yeah, there should be a little beeping thing, right, that is able to detect uh, the uh, the level of Melkos uh, in any given thing. Yeah, but I mean, it, there'd be a lot of background noise, Jennifer. A lot, a lot of background noise. It'd be hard to separate it from the background noise, really. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, Matt says, when the hills slide and the land breaks apart after the destruction of the ring, I guess this happens because his control over the Melkos and the land has been released. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He was controlling that. It was by the power of that, that these things, like that's how the, the Baradur he built with the power of some of those Melkos, right? He took probably a couple milli, a couple milli Melkos, right? And used that to construct, uh, the dark tower, right? And then when he loses... You know, he loses the control of all of those Melkos. It collapses into pieces. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, David says, I wonder if the specimen, if the specialness of Mithril comes because it's free or nearly so of Melkor's influence. Yes. I think that's exactly the case. Look, we'll see something like that here, just, just here. It is quite possible, of course, that certain elements or conditions of matter had attracted Morgoth's special attention, mainly unless in the remote past for reasons of his own plans. For example, all gold in Middle-earth seems to have a specially evil trend. Dragon sickness, you see, is endemic in gold itself. But not silver. Water is represented as being almost entirely free of Morgoth. This, of course, does not mean that any particular sea, stream, river, well, or even vessel of water could be poisoned or defiled, as all things could. So, if, Jennifer, you could build a Milko counter, it'd be awfully useful. You could use it to find gold. You could use it to find water, right, by, by measuring the uh, decrease in the Milko counter. At, boy, that'd be actually a really useful thing. I mean, again, it'd, it'd be hard with the background noise, but um, but you could, yeah, right. And then you pass by, you know, like <laughs> Washington D.C. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Bygones. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's stop there. <laughs> let's stop there. Um, uh, let's just say there are certain places I think where the Melco counter would probably increase. Uh, in its little beepings. Um, okay. I'm tempted to go on, but I mean, we just got to the title of the book, right? Finally, in class number 27. Uh, so this seems like a, a good place to stop. Next time, we are going, next time is going to be our last discussion. Hear me now and believe me later. Next week is going to be our last discussion of Morgoth's Ring. And we are going to be talking a great deal about orcs as he comes back and reconsiders the orc question. Tolkien knows full well what a problem the orcs are. And we are going to see him beginning to apply some serious creativity to the orc problem. And we'll see how we think he does. So thanks, everybody. See you for our final session next week. Uh, and uh, I'll probably see you before then. But anyway, thanks, everybody. Good night now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.